coming up. It's my job in this field to sort of formulate stories. Then I write memos and try to convince either the World News or Good Morning America or occasionally Nightline to do the stories that I am proposing. So it's not automatic that your piece will get on the no, air? No, on the, on the network, uh, we are not always on the air, nor is it automatic once you are even, now when we get to the next stage, assume that I propose something and they say, oh yes, that's a great idea, let's go out and do it. N that is not an automatic assumption that the piece will eventually end up on the air. What sometimes happens is since I cover uh, environmental issues, health and safety issues, uh, I've been doing a lot of aviation safety issues, uh, those stories usually make it, but sometimes they'll say to me, well, does this piece have to go on tonight? Mm -hmm. And in all honesty, I frequently have to answer no. And in the light of what's happening with the Supreme Court, what's happening in the Persian Gulf, what's happening with the President, sometimes they'll say, well, let's save it. If they save it, then what happens is that it sort of tends to sit around a while. Until it gets and, old. <laughs> until it gets old. Yeah. And sometimes then it loses the momentum uh, for getting on the air. Let me just say that we've had a lot of uh, financial cutbacks recently at the networks. And one of the effects of this has been a very good thing for people like me in that when they accept a story now, when they actually say we're going to commit ourselves to it and we're going to send you out to do it, they really mean they're going to put it on the air. They don't the percentage of material that gets on the air versus the percentage of what is shot has increased dramatically. Well, didn't it used to be that you might have two or three reporters covering the same story? You know, in the, old, in, in the old days, we had uh, just, you know, very few people. Now we do have uh, a very large staff, and if you have the major story of the day, uh, yes, you may have several reports. For example, at if there's a development in the Persian Gulf, you might have a report from the White House, you might have something from the State Department, you might have something from Congress, all looking at the aspects of what has happened. And you might have one from the Persian Gulf, so you'd have a whole package, three or four spots on the same on the same topic. Do your assignments usually take you out of town, even well, across the world? Or? I'm, I'm a senior correspondent, which means two things. One, I've been around for a long time, and I, I got the title, not more money. But, oh, well. Uh, <laughs> what, it, what it means is that I try very hard to stay in Washington. I, I mean, I do travel, but not nearly as much as I used to. Also, when I when I'm assigned a story, I mean, in the last two weeks, I've done two special assignments, which have taken me to California twice, one for each of them, uh, Cincinnati, North Carolina, New York, upstate New York to Albany. I mean, I've been all over the place, but it's unusual to have two in a row. Uh, if you, if something happens and they say go do the story, if a break, I mean, if a plane crashes, say in Detroit, they may say go to Detroit. I mean, that's obviously a breaking news story, and you just go ahead and you're there for as however many days or weeks or uh, as it, as it takes. But short of that, I try to stay mostly in Washington because the stories I cover are based on the regulatory agencies in Washington, and that allows me to have. Uh, some semblance of a personal life. I Not much, but some. I was going to ask you about that. Now, in the beginning, when you first started with the network, you must have traveled, what, 20 yes. days out of 30 As a matter of fact, I remember in 1976, I joined the network in 1974, and I remember the campaign of 76. I spent three nights in a row at home, and I thought I had fallen out of favor with ABC. I thought it was all over because I was home wrong. so much. <laughs> but since then, and also, I was based in New York City then. And New York was basically a traveling city. We don't really cover that much news that is strictly out of New York. I mean, well, of course, now with the stock market and all the financial yeah. news. But apart from that, we don't cover a lot of things. And in those days, we didn't have bureaus in Dallas and Denver and all sorts of places. So I spent several months in Texas one time because every time I was there, they would call up and say, oh, do this other story. I mean, I felt like I was moving to Texas. Then I went to London. I was assigned substitute work for one week only. Eight weeks later, I'm calling the office, and the desk assistants in the office say, oh, I hear you're moving to London. I said, well, that's really interesting. Nobody's told me <laughs> that news to me. Uh, start about back when you first got into the career. How did you? Well, I'm really, um, this was not a lifelong ambition to be in TV news. Is I, it for most people, even? I think it is now. But when I, I've always been a writer. I wrote fiction. I wrote poetry. I always thought of myself as a writer. Um, I ended up 
in college with a double major, which were which was psychology and English. But I got into news more or less by accident, and it was I was at uh, Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. My first husband was in graduate school. I was basically working. I had three jobs as a waitress to try to keep the family together while he was going to school. And I heard them advertising on a little FM radio station for people who would like to come along and volunteer for the news department. And this sounded very intriguing to me. I had no idea what it was all about. But I had previously been trained. Uh, and I, had, I, had, I was an early college dropout. And I went to England, where I went to professional acting school and got a, a two-year diploma in that and subsequently worked in English repertory theater in various cities in England and Wales for about two years. And during the course of my training, we had some courses in radio. This was in preparation for radio soap operas. Now, in Britain, radio soap operas in that era were, were very popular because television hadn't come in to the extent yeah. it has now. And at one point, I was offered a job on the BBC as a radio soap opera opera actress. Well, as it turned out, since I am not British, I could not accept the job working for the British Broadcasting Corporation, but I just kept in the back of my mind that I had a good voice mm -hmm. for radio. So when I heard them advertising for people to help on this little FM station, I went along, and I used to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, and we lived downtown in Ithaca, in a town which is full of hills, if any people are not familiar with it. And I used to have to trudge uphill to go to the little station at 5 so I could start preparing to do the news at 6. And I've always been a reporter or an anchor woman, but I have done it in some of the strangest places you can imagine. Where'd you go after the radio station? Well, after after Ithaca, well, I went to, oh, then I went to have my first job in television. I went to WCIC-TV, a cable station in Ithaca, New York, where I first became the drama critic. I then uh, started doing regular reporting, and when they offered me a job to become the co-anchor woman for the, their news show, I thought about that, but I ended up going home to Long Island and I got a job at WGBB AM and FM Radio Freeport, <laughs> New York. I was paid $2 an hour, and I used to work, and I, I wasn't put on staff. It was an hourly wage, because then there were, there were no vacations, there were no medical, there was no, no benefits, no nothing, but $2 an hour. And I was working in the Nassau County Courthouse press room which is sort of like the front page press room updated, if you've seen that famous movie. And it was, it was a lot of fun. Uh, I worked doing radio spots during the day. And then I used to work at night. And I had to go into the station and do newscast. Now, there were two people in the station. There was a the DJ and there was me, which meant that I had to engineer my own board. I had to take in the feeds. We did two local tags. We took. A newscast from, I think it was UPI, gave us a five-minute newscast. Mm -hmm. And then I did a three-minute local tag, which I had to gather, read, and write. And then I did two minutes on the half hour. And after that, I had to leave some voice reports for the morning show. I had to take in the sports feeds and all of that, and basically do everything, including sweep the floors, which is how you learn. How did ABC pick you up then? When, when well, did I mean, we've got a lot of time. We have the whole story <laughs> of my life. I started. After uh, WGBB, uh, incidentally, I st the reason I went to WGBB is it's very near to New York radio, mm -hmm. which is, of course, the number one market. And I figured that if I got enough experience and exposure, I could try to get a job in the big time in the big city. So I started doing interviews and trying to send my tape out to stations in New York, most of whom laughed at me saying, well, you really don't have very much yeah. experience. And I would say, well, please give me an audition, give me a shot. And they would say, come back and see us in two years or something like that. I started working, I, well, I auditioned for WCBS, which is all news radio mm -hmm. in New York. And this began my freelance period. They offered me freelance work. So I started reporting from Long Island for WCBS. And then they would call me on specific days to come into the city and be one of their reporters when it, someone else was on vacation or sick or had something else mm -hmm. to do. And that's I also started anchoring. I used to anchor prime time, two hours at a clip. I did 
12 to 2 a.m. And I oh. did 4 to 6 a.m. <gasps> and you go in at 10 o'clock and you spend two hours writing your, uh -huh. your newscast beforehand. And then you come off the air at 2 o'clock. You, you take an hour's break. And then you start at 3 o'clock to write your, you know, your, your 4 o'clock show. Did you ever think you'd be where you are now? In well, this I, had, I had hoped. I, ha I had great hopes by, the, uh, by this point. But of course, when I first started anchoring at WCBS, it was overnight. And of course, I figured nobody was listening. Right. But I was wrong. I used to get a tremendous number of you know, calls and, and letters. I tried. Actually, I didn't want to go over to the television side because I enjoyed radio so much. I should also point out that I worked for the Associated Press as a writer. We would take the regular A wire and we would rewrite it into five minute newscasts which go out to the stations for broadcast. This is excellent training for news writing because you have an hour to produce a five minute newscast. You select the stories from those on the AP wire, you write them in broadcast style and you put them out. And I used to do this. This was be called being a, a variable writer. They had three shifts, eight to four. I never got that one. <laughs> Sometimes I got right. four to midnight, but I always got midnight until 8 a.m. Uh, working overnight. And I was also writing for the New York Times. I needed, I, I mean, I was freelance then, and when you're, when you're freelance in this business, you're always afraid to turn down any assignment because you think, tomorrow nobody is going to call, I won't be able to make a living. What do you have to be like, what kind of person do you think you have well, to be to make it in this career? I, I am convinced that you have, to, it's your personal qualities of really being persistent and really being determined. Now, I did not start in the news business until I was 26 years old. And people used to tell me, especially at these little radio stations that I worked at, well, you're too old, you're overeducated, you're too this, you're not going to take a job that's going to pay you so little. I mean, $2 an hour is laughable now, but it was pretty pitiful then, too. Uh, and I kept on, despite the fact, I, I was going to tell you, and perhaps I should, that um, when I the reason I left WGBB, AM and FM, Freeport, besides the fact that the news director used to chase me, he'd come in in his Little League baseball outfit quite drunk at night after he'd taken his kids home, sort of chased me around the desk. But I was going for all these auditions, and at one point, somebody tried to sabotage my day off, and then I got into trouble because I said I just couldn't come in the next day because I had planned to go for an audition in New York. He fired me, and he told me I had absolutely no talent, and I was never going to make it in the business. And you just have to not believe well, that. Well, <laughs> you have to be either terribly stubborn, uh, terribly dumb, or terribly persistent. But I feel that this, there is no formula about how to make it in this business. My, my story is not typical, and I do not hold myself out as a pattern for anybody who seeks to work in broadcast news. But I think that whatever background you have, you really have to be determined. First of all, it is an extremely competitive business. I frequently tell people now, I can deal with the competition from other networks. That doesn't bother me at all. What I find is far more challenging is the competition within my own network to get the assignments, to get the opportunities. Do the women tend to stick together to help each other, or is there a lot of competitiveness? Uh, now they do. We uh, at ABC have uh, formed a women's advisory board, and we work with management on some of the problems that women broadcasters have had. And while women are, women are made to feel, well, you know, there's the, the woman's spot or, you know, the woman's slot on the, on the anchor team, we've been made to feel that we're competing against each other. But in recent years, I have to tell you, there's a very much different atmosphere. It has changed so that there's a much more supportive feeling amongst the women that if we all stick together, everybody will benefit. In other words, the water level of airtime for women will go up. There'll be more opportunities. But we still need to do a lot of work as far as equality. I do not want to suggest that things are perfect. I will tell you, I've been at ABC almost 13 years now. I have seen tremendous changes mm -hmm. in the time that I've been there. And I've seen an awful lot more women on the air. And there are an awful lot of women a lot more women working behind the scenes. But I don't want to suggest that women get the prime assignments. Well, do you think that we'll ever see a, a woman as old as Walter Cronkite was on the air? Or? But you know what I, I keep hoping is I, I'm in the baby boom generation, and there's this huge bulge in the population that, that will be aging in the same group that I am. And I feel that we do 
One of the best things that's ever happened to all of us women is people like Linda Evans and Joan Collins, because it used to be that you were finished when you were in your 40s. Right. Now we see on television these terribly glamorous women who are in their 50s. 50s and I think that as we, perhaps our attitude towards aging will change. I mean, in my own mind, I used to think, well, I'd be all finished in television when I got to be in my 40s. Well, I have to tell you, 40s, there are women, I can tell you, who are extremely good and extremely attractive on in their 50s. I can't tell you whether they'll ever make it into their 60s, but at our affiliate in Cleveland, there is a, a woman, anchor woman, who is under contract who is in her 70s. And she is one of these redoubtable old people whom everybody respects highly, and she's very popular, and she's, she's doing extremely well. So, I mean, I think there is a, the possibility. Do you think we will see a, a woman in a, in a Peter Jennings spot? I th probably we're going to see not a woman instead of Peter Jennings, but in the future we'll see a woman along with Peter Jennings, as the local stations seem to have male and female anchor teams. Mm -hmm. I think that that prospect is possible in the future for the networks, but I think it'll be a long time before you see a woman sitting there by, by herself. Now, let me say this. When Dan Rather is away on CBS, frequently a woman, Diane Sawyer mm -hmm. or Leslie Stahl, or someone will sit in for him as a substitute, which didn't used to happen either. That's only happened in the last few years. But I think that progress is being made, but progress is slow, and we have to just keep on working. I mean, it's no, I, I remember at one time CBS had two women anchoring their morning news show, which you never find. And recently on ABC, we had two women instead of the man and the woman on Good Morning America. We had Kathleen Sullivan and Barbara Walters. And I was watching, I was thinking, you know, five years ago, that would never have happened. Yeah. They would have made sure there was at least one man there. What about the pay scale? Is it, is it balanced or not? For women? Well, um, the pay scale, uh, now you're speaking As on the air. As compared to what a, uh, what a man might get. Well, I just, I, I point out that, I mean, on, on the average, I do think women will make on the air as much as men do. Um, years will ago. Will make, though, right? No, no, I think, that, no, I, I mean to say, I think they do. Mm -hmm. One of the most closely guarded secrets in the whole business is how much people make. Now, superstars, of course, make super salaries. But, I mean, at my level of the working correspondent, I think I do pretty well in comparison with male colleagues. I mean, I'm not, I don't think that I'm slighted in terms of salary. What is the average pay for a senior correspondent? I really don't know. But I would guess, I mean, starting correspondents are between, I would say, sixty and seventy thousand uh, dollars. Senior correspondents make an excess of a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. We have superstar correspondents on the level of Richard Threlkeld who make multiples of that. Uh, and it's, it, I once asked when I first started Harry Reasoner, who used to be at ABC for some advice about contract negotiations, and he gave me some really excellent advice, which is you have to get anything you can from the network without a rifle. <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is a competitive business yeah. and what you are worth is determined by, does anybody else want you? Does well, they always say, too, you know, there's somebody waiting in the wings for your job. You know? Oh, yes. Well, they always terrify me that there are, you know, four or five, well, there are thousands of young people just getting out of college who are bright and talented and ambitious and hardworking and who will come in and start and work for an awful lot less than I'm willing to work for. The only thing one can do is you get on in your career and say, right, okay, I accept that. If you don't wish to give me a job, you know, I'll I'll do something else, but it certainly does keep us on our toes. I'm a much more valuable correspondent now than when I've started. I've learned a few things. I've learned a lot of the shortcuts. I, I've learned, do you know, when we frequently, um, I'm one of the people who does what they call crash landings. That is a late breaking story where we have a 6.30 newscast and I will start at 5.30 for what will become the lead story at 6.30. And there's an awful lot of pressure to do that. That means that I am not going to write a script which is considered by a bunch of editors and producers in Washington or transmitted by computer to New York where people will go around and pick it apart. What will happen is Peter Jennings will call me up and he'll say, here's the lead-in, is that okay? And I saw, I'll say, yes, Peter, I'm going to start with the line and I'll read him probably the first paragraph, which is probably at this stage all I've got written. And I'll be typing one paragraph as they're editing the one preceding it, and the first time they ever hear my script, 
is when it's on the air. And that's where you And have this is what separates right. the correspondents from the goats. I mean, right. because there is a great, great margin for error. And you, you have to feel confident enough that you're going to be able to do this, let alone uh, be able to do something which they may say, well, you should have used this phrase, or you know, they come back to you afterwards. So there's an awful lot of pressure doing this. I mean, most people could start out at, say, 10 o'clock in the morning covering a hearing, mm -hmm. and then it's over at 12, 1 o'clock. You have plenty of time to go back and consider, look at your notes, and write a script, submit it by 3 o'clock, and the show doesn't go on until 6.30. That's, that's reasonable. Most people can handle that. But can you handle a live shot when they come to you when you're not really quite prepared? Can you, for example, when the Air Florida plane crashed into the bridge at Washington National Airport and it was snowy and cold and, I mean, January, bitter, bitter cold, can you stand there and, and go live after being on your feet for 48 hours? I mean, literally, with just going home once to take a shower and not having any sleep. This is what, this is what really makes the difference. And, Sometimes, I mean, I feel, I, I certainly feel somewhat still like a beginner in this business. What I enjoy about it is I'm learning all the time. Each story I do is a, is a different challenge. It's something you don't, you can't ever get stale in this business because no matter what you think, the story will not be the way you think it's going to come out. And that's what makes it exciting and different. What about network news? There's a lot of talk that um, news is going more local now and that network news might eventually even be phased out. What, what do you think? What's well, the talk there? I, I, I think that you, you have come up with the ultimate scenario. I'm not sure the network news will ever be phased out, but it is very true what you are saying, that n local stations are playing a much greater role because uh, satellites. I mean, we can send anything on the satellite anytime, anywhere, and it just takes a few minutes. What will happen is the local stations will take in from their network affiliate or independent sources a feed of, say, the president introducing his latest Supreme Court nominee. And then they have it for their 5 o'clock or 5.30 news, and they can put that on the air, and their anchor team can look as though they are right there covering the White House. That is happening to a much greater extent. Local stations, when a big story happens, will frequently send their own people mm -hmm. to cover it, not depending on the network. Well, the network has got to adjust and change with the times. And what we have started to do, I mean, first of all, it's not really fair or right to assume that while the local station can take the pictures from the White House or the White House briefing and turn that material around, that they are going to be able to give the same perspective on that story mm -hmm. as someone who works at the White House like my colleague Sam Donaldson. I mean, he will be able to give the, you know, the insight and the perspective that is not going to be in the wire copy, that's not going to be on the feed of pictures. So that is precisely what we have to do. Use the people we have to try to give a little more insight and perspective, not just the here they come, there they go type thing that you, you might see on the news, to give a little more background because this is where we can excel. Is there anything about um, the way the network does news that bothers you that you would like to change? Maybe anything uh, ethics? Oh, I, or? well, I feel that we have to show uh, more sensitivity and responsibility, particularly when it comes to covering personal tragedies. Um, I'm not alone in this. I, I think it was wrong of us to broadcast pictures, which we got from a local affiliate. Uh, we did not shoot them our, ourselves. Mm -hmm. Of the Marines going up, knocking on doors to inform the I next of kin that, that uh, their loved one had been among the Marines killed in the uh, bombing uh, on the American Embassy in Beirut. I think that shows uh, a lack of sensitivity. I think we have to be uh, just, just more careful about how we, how we approach things. I'm not alone in this. Uh, I frequently am in the position of trying to interview people who have been uh, so, who have suffered some loss. And I very simply find that half the time the people find some comfort and some catharsis in being able to talk about the tragedy, and sometimes they don't want to talk about it. I never pursue them, I never run after them, I never try to convince them, I just ask them. And I mean, I've had people come up and throw their arms around me, and women who had not been able to talk about this 
they one, in one case for two years and said, you know, you're the first person I've really been able to open up to, and I'm so grateful that you allowed me to talk about her son who had been killed in a prior accident. But sometimes you just have to step back and, and leave it. And I think we, we need to increase our, our sensitivity to that. Uh, Sam Donaldson comes under fire a lot by critics. You know, they well, say you know, he's Sam too liberal or he's too opinionated. What do you think? Well, Sam, I have to tell you, and it's not because I work for ABC, Sam is not only the best White House correspondent, for one thing, he's got the loudest voice. And this <laughs> president, Mr. Reagan, is so isolated from us that uh, we have very little access to the president. There are very few opportunities to question him. But, I mean, when Jimmy Carter left office, he, of course, willed Ronald Reagan two things. One was Menachem Begin, <laughs> then Prime Minister of Israel, and the other was <laughs> Sam Donaldson. Now, Sam Donaldson is one of the best things that's ever happened to Ronald Reagan because the president can treat him. The president comes out and sort of treats the White House press corps sort of like a kindergarten class, acts like an exasperated teacher. Says, oh, well, Sam, since you ask the question, he acts as though he's doing Sam and the nation a great favor by answering the question when, in fact, the president owes it to the American people and to the press to answer questions. I mean, I think Ronald Reagan uses Sam as a foil and um, is one of the best things that's ever happened to him. We've only got a couple of seconds left, so I want to wrap it up by asking you what you think you'll do after television. Is there life after TV? Oh, yes, TV? of course there is life after television. I'm not sure what I'm going to do what I, when I grow up in the real world yet. A lot of women say, you know, that, that, that when you're in television news, your career is shorter than it might be, say, if you were a, a lawyer or something, you know, where you... You retire at 65. Well, I'm, I'm really looking forward to I'm I'm a horse breeder, which is what I wanted to do all my life. And I would be very happy to ride and train horses. We are active with hunter jumpers, and I'm hoping to race some of my thoroughbreds, oh, that's and that's awesome. what I'd love to do. Where's your horse farm? In, uh, in Loudoun County, near Leesburg, Virginia. It's kind of a nice balance to the hectic career you've Yes, I enjoy there. it very much. We have the rural life. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Joan. We've been talking with Bettina Gregory, who is a senior correspondent with ABC News. This is worth quoting, part of the lecture series by the Women's Center at Florida Community College in Jacksonville.